All right. Good morning. It's still uh, morning, barely, and uh, I get the pleasure of being between you guys and lunch. So, uh, uh, so thank you, Emily, for for putting me between uh, a bunch of range range folks in there. Like, very dangerous place to be. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, uh, my name is Derek Wilson. I work in uh, Northern California for BLM, and uh, we uh, uh, implemented our AIM project a couple of years ago, uh, following uh, our biggest. Uh, Biggest fire that we've had for uh, in California was the Rush Fire, um, and um, and we had a lot of different uh, things we were looking at, um, and one of them including this is safe jobs. So um, we'll get going. Uh, so in Northern California, um, the three offices that have safe jobs habitat are uh, the Service Field Office, Eagle Lake Field Office, and the Scribe Field Office. Um, all together, there are 2.8 million acres that we're looking at. Um, and it, all, it extends, it starts in California, but we also manage a private bit of land in um, northwest uh, Nevada. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have different partners and whatnot across the state lines. Uh, it's mainly in um, uh, Great Basin and um, in the Murdoch Plateau. Uh, that's where kind of our area that we're managing again. And so since, you know, the stage drop, they don't, they don't um, uh, use all the habitat of, you know, 2.8 million acres. What we did is we really needed to focus down on um, on uh, a smaller area because uh, uh, you know I'm trying to relate this back to um, some some management actions that we can take now. And so um, so what we did is, is this actually is a product from uh, from Fiat um, from our area. Uh, the uh, the polygons there um, we're referring to as over habitat areas, and they're based on 75 percent breeding bird density. We also augmented that with local knowledge and um, some telemetry data that we've had, and so uh, it was a, it was an effort with um, some of our partners and whatnot to um, to come up with where we think the sage grouse were most used, uh, and so so that that kind of sets the stage, and, and so um, to uh, and then the other piece of this too is there's been a lot of research in the last five years, especially as far as uh, identifying what the requirements are in the different life cycles of sage grouse. And so uh, what we did is um, we're just looking at some of the uh, terrestrial uh, indicators that that um, we think that we can answer with some of our aim data. Um, uh, so we broke it down into uh, um, into into three of the four. So we have the nesting requirement our brood rate, um, summer requirements, and then our um, uh, winter requirements. Um, and so, and so really the project design, like I said, we started off a couple years ago, and, and we were looking at multiple resources. And so, you know, traditionally, I guess, you know, each program had their their own monitoring method and their own things that they were collecting, and, and we're, we're duplicating some efforts in, in, in some of and so um, we started from, you know, these basic management questions um, that, you know, derive from our standards uh, for rangeland health, uh, grazing permit renewals and issuances, uh, law force and borough management, you know, uh, trying to define better, you know, when we're meeting that TNEP, that Friday Natural Ecological Balance, uh, of course, stage grouse habitat management, um, and then also uh, aquatic resources, um, Scott's been in our area working and helping us find that. Uh, in addition to that, ESNR actions. I mean, that was one of the biggest things before the rush fire was, uh, or during the rush fire, is we were trying to look at um, what was there before the fire. And that's always a big question, right? And uh, we didn't have a lot of data to really help um, point us down that direction that would help us to uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, plan our actions in, in response to that. Um, and so, uh, actually, I just saw on Facebook the other day, um, I thought it was applicable. There was a Chinese proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is right now. So, anyways, I thought that, that applied to our monitoring strategy here. It would have been great 20 years ago, but, you know, we don't have it 20 years ago, so, so here, here we are right now. Um, so, for the analysis, we basically, um, the so all the field of the 2.8 million acres, that's what we based our, our count up points on. That was the sample, the sample size. And so we ended up uh, post-stratifying with the, the polygon from the local habitat areas uh, to try to try to help answer or at least get us closer to that question and focus us down um, on where we're at with the current status of the state of habitat. And um, and so we collected um, 
uh, points in 2013 and in 2014. Um, you know, but like I said, um, I'm not sure if I, I mentioned this before, um, the full design is expected for five years. So we still have three more years that we want to collect for. Um, but this is, so this is just kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a quick look, it's a preliminary look, but um, as we go um, through this program and integrating things like remote sensing, we're hoping to really kind of focus down even more um, but we do have management actions we have to make this year, and so we're really interested in trying to pull the data right now and see if we can, uh, uh, you know, basically put the money where we need to uh, and, and put our efforts where we need to. Okay, so this is the this is the end result of the analysis, and, and you know, this is, uh, you know, I guess, you know, caveat this is somewhat flawed because even though we focus down into those bulk areas, you know, we don't expect that 100% of those bulk areas are going to be nesting or um, uh, nesting nesting habitat. Um, so, so anyways, um, uh, what I did though is, is I did want to kind of look across the spectrum just to see um, uh, how these uh, these requirements were across our our whole district and whatnot. Um, and and so if we start with the uh, um, let's start with the the, the shrub cover, the uh, greater than 20%. Um, uh, shrub cover requirement. Uh, there's actually three of the of the ten areas that we have um, uh, with the, our focal areas actually exceeded that in in the average, um, and then the rest of them were below. Um, but but I guess what the uh, the red flag for us um, that highlights is is there's four areas that were actually below the ten percent, and so that would really that really kind of helps to uh, to flag the idea of like okay we need to really focus on. Uh, those areas that have that really, really low um, sagebrush cover. Um, uh, then also, so the all shrub covers, you know, rated at 30%. Um, and it, it's interesting, actually, to, to, to see the data. And uh, uh, in most areas, the, uh, the, uh, the shrub cover is primarily composed of sagebrush. We don't really have a lot of other shrub cover out there, except in a couple of areas. Um, so that was that was important to know, but this uh, this uh, um, indicator on the far left that you know states that if it's greater than 10% residual, you need greater than 10% um, residual biofrenal grass cover. If your shrub cover is less than 25%, um, we actually met across the landscape in that manner, uh, which tells us that you know for our area, um, for what we're lacking in some shrub cover, for uh, uh, we are we make up in a lot of perennial grass cover. Um, so which has implications for grazing management and of course burrow management and whatnot. Um, so then, um, oh wait, let me go back. Uh, the last indicator was the um, invasive annual grasses. Uh, for our area, we primarily have uh, Medusa head and she grass as the as as the uh, uh, primary uh, primary culprit. And, uh, and actually, in recent years, it's been um, noticed, uh, not documented, but noticed that the Medusa has really been creeping in and uh, becoming more and more um, prevalent, especially in our, our, our uh, 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 clay areas. Uh, but anyways, uh, looking across this, you know, once again, it's across the whole landscape. It's not just looking at, at nesting. Um, but uh, we do have some areas that have very, very, very little uh, uh, cheatgrass uh, she grass cover, uh, you know, 1.13 percent. That's uh, pretty good when you consider the highest is at 32 percent um, uh, invasive grass cover. Um, and so what this helps us to do is, is uh, especially even for fire management planning for the, for the years, focusing in on, on different things, we can we can uh, identify uh, uh, different areas that we might take different tactics. I mean, we're not going to go out and try to cheat cheat grass in the uh, area where there's you know 32 percent. Uh, uh, cover and whatnot. It's, it's just unfeasible. But the areas that, that are up north that, you know, have very little areas, we could go in and, and find out what's actually going on there at the, at the local scale, if it's isolated pockets of cheap gas, um, and then we could um, actually put some um, some uh, different objectives and whatnot and some of our management um, restrictions there, or management um, objectives there. Um, brood rearing in summer, um, this one was really tricky, the perennial spore cover. Uh, greater than five percent, um, uh, you know, printing reports, I mean, they're not uniform across the landscape. Uh, uh, however, uh, this does highlight a few things. Um, uh, in all, in, in across the landscape, we weren't meeting this this threshold across the landscape. Uh, uh, 
But there's a couple of things to note that were really surprising uh, in the High Rock uh, area and then also in the North Coast Lake area. Those were the lowest spring of floor cover. Uh, the High Rock was 0.64%. Uh, uh, that's really low. Um, and so for us, that, that really highlights um, we haven't necessarily been paying attention that much to the floor cover in the terrestrial, but all of a sudden this this um, this really highlights uh, highlights that. And, and um, basically, we need to take a closer look to see if this is this is really happening on the landscape at the smaller scales. Okay. Yeah. So in the in the um, map of precipitation, when it comes to Nevada, we find that this part of Nevada is not summer precip. So I'm thinking of 30 years ago, had this rest focused on meadows for late blueberry habitat. Do these data represent meadows or terrestrial uplands? This is terrestrial uplands. This is, yeah, we have not been collecting our uh, riparian, riparian data yet. So that is when? Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that in the next step at the very end because, yeah, that, that is a very good point. Those indicators that I put up earlier, that's only a small portion of all the indicators. And so if we're, you know, looking at that, you know, city grouse management, we need to look at the big picture and um, see, uh, you know, see where exactly some of the, the, um, the, all the indicators are falling apart so we can spend our money appropriately in the best place as possible. Um, and then once again, in the winter, um, winter habitat, uh, you need greater than 10%. Um, sagebrush cover um, across the landscape, uh, six of the ten we were meeting across the landscape, there was four that were um, were, were, were lower than. Um, uh, there's also another one that I think we can probably analyze with the AIM data currently. Uh, it's the sagebrush type cover that commonly uh, suggested for winter habitat. Uh, because we have been uh, collecting uh, both uh, woody and um, non woody um, height on our LPI, our plant point intercept data. So, so we'll be able to, to uh, produce an analysis of that. Um, so, you know, this is great, you know, having those averages and whatnot, but it really led me to the question, uh, you know, the next question, because that's usually what these things lead to the next question, right? And uh, um, which actually was answered yesterday when I saw someone else's slide, is, um, is it's great to see that cover, but the next question was, of these uh, core areas, what percentage of that area meets this requirement? So what percentage of the area meets the 20% requirement, which um, uh, Sarah Romaya provided a slide for me yesterday in different discussions where they're able to calculate that. I wasn't sure if we were able to calculate that at this point with the data we have, uh, but that's going to be the next steps for us uh, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming weeks and whatnot. So we can really start to, I guess, really, really focus down and make it more clear what's happening on the landscape as a status, um, uh, as far as status goes. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned a few of these before. Um, some of our management actions is, you know, fire uh, protection priorities and fuel breaks, um, uh, emergency stabilization and rehab activities, uh, invasive annual grass control, uh, restoration activities, whether it be sagebrush, grass spores, um, and then you know, also we're going to have to, you know, tackle the invasive annual grass problem there. Um, and then grazing management, wild horse and burrow management. Um, so I guess just kind of kind of going back to uh, where this land and the landscape as far as that data goes, this map really shows uh, the stage risk cover was believed that under that 10% in those four local areas at the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the, of the park range. Um, and it's not really that surprising. Uh, uh, the uh, the rush fire, interesting to know, the rush fire, that 315,000 acre fire that was like smack dab in the middle of our um, uh, habitat was was there on the the bottom the bottom right and, and so that's uh, you know it's still in, in recovery right now uh, uh, from that from the fire but um, what this tells us is um, you know with the sagebrush cover being so low down there uh, we do have a pretty good spring out grass cover uh, and so that means during the nesting period that's kind of the the perennial grass cover is extremely important. And so um, we've actually worked with one uh, permittee on this, but but this is a, a case in point where we can we can work with our permittees and look at our different uh, livestock management techniques and uh, and maybe uh, not graze those 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 that pasture or that area that has that nesting habitat in the springtime. We can defer that to later in the season. Obviously, we're going to have to um, put that into our our deep mix of looking at all the different resources that could affect. 
across the spectrum, but but at least that puts it into the, the, the realm of possibility and raises the issue, which helps to identify the alternatives within our NEPA documents. Um, uh, like I said, you know, panel grass cover um, is uh, is pretty high, and so you know, and, and the same thing too is uh, we have lots of Walt Worsham Borough uh, uh, HMAs out there. Uh, you know, Twin Peaks is you know where the rush fire was. That's uh, Private and BLM, that's 800,000 acres. That's a huge area that surprised us, I think, 11 HMAs out there. And so this is important too because then we can start to focus in on, on this. And then when, when we're describing TEV, right, and actually flexible balance, we can we can help to focus in on um, on a safety component of that. And, and, and so that can go into our documents and help us decide, you know, not just we're going to gather this many horses, but we're going to gather horses in this area and this area and this area. Uh, um, the impacts it has to these different um, life cycle stages. Um, so the shrub cover, cover, uh, premium four cover. Uh, yeah, like I said, premium four cover. I mean, that's, that's going to be an interesting one, I think. And it's that, just this slide that really helps to highlight uh, what we need to uh, we, we start to need to focus on um, in, in our management actions. Uh, we haven't really been thinking about it in a terrestrial aspect. We've mainly been thinking about it in an aquatic uh, aspect. Um, and then, of course, our invasive annual grass cover. Um, so our next steps, uh, we'll continue to, uh, collecting our uh, aquatic and terrestrial report indicators in the 2015 field season. Uh, for our terrestrial indicators, like I said, we still have uh, three more years this, this summer to, to collect. Um, include collection of uh, supplemental indicators for riparian vegetation, uh, specifically what's driving that is space grass, because some of the other um, uh, indicators are like at least a 50% uh, cover for you know, metal areas uh, and five, five uh, species, and so um, uh, that's really our next step to, to really help to help uh, answer you know more more questions about the safe house. Um, and then also you know utilize the, the remote sensing. You haven't really utilized that. I, I guess I, I heard rumors of some other products out there that will help us <laughs> into the future on this, um, and uh, can also be a product for indicators to help answer uh, the management questions. Larger spectrum, and so special thanks. This has been a huge, um, huge project starting a couple of years ago. Uh, so, uh, especially after the field office, Eagle Lake, all and surprise, uh, the folks out there really took in this on, uh, really thought hard, uh, came up with some great management questions, and uh, and really challenged the whole, you know, the whole end protocol. Uh, and, and I believe we, we've come with a better product from that. Uh, Ornata, so Sarah McCord, she's been working with us, and Jason Carl, that really helped, you know. Uh, you know, formulate the, the big picture and how we're going to do this to not Emily, Happy Bubble, Sarah, uh, and, and the board. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah. Well, in, in, the, uh, in the winter in Habitat, I think it was, oh, sorry, yeah. He was asking what the, the height requirement is for sagebrush or for sage grouse. And so what the um, uh, in the literature it was commonly that identified that, that I think it was nine point eight inches of sagebrush height, um, height within the uh, wintering habitat. So <clears throat> yeah. What are you using for site reference? Well, this is just a status. We haven't gone into the Condition as far as like compare, where we're just looking for an inventory of what we have on the landscape right now. That's actually a very good follow-up question because that's really the next step is is identifying some of these areas that well, what's the potential um, where we can go in and uh, and, uh, uh, and work with here? Yeah. Um, I think the first year we were, we were, we were pretty late out there um, as far as you know, July and August, uh, but we really tried to focus down on, uh, you know, we tried to follow the, the seasonality up the slope, you know, so to speak, and uh, and then last year we, we were able to start collecting data in April, and so all the way through the summer. There was a little bit of forensic botany the first, um, the first uh, summer we collected data, we were a little late. Oh, okay. Oh. Thank you so much.
so much, Derek, and all our presenters this morning.